Hey guys, and welcome to an analysis of First Encounter, the Soul Recount, the original. And I'll be talking about the uh, artificial intelligence in this. Hope you guys are good. I'd send one of my boys, but I think we need a specialist for this one. Alright, so uh, basically you are part of a special operations team. You find that gate control yet? Which encounters uh, paranormal activity and uh, Come on, we ain't got all day. And you respond to it, so it's it's uh, paranormal events that obviously normal uh, police forces or uh, special operations wouldn't, wouldn't be able to handle. Uh, so the storyline, it's a mix of horror and first-person shooter. Uh, it could be called the tactical shooter in the sense of... Uh, there are some interesting tactics associated with that. Alright, so let's, uh, let me actually find out where to go here. Hopefully we'll encounter some enemy and I can show you uh, what that looks like. Alright, so down there is a uh, Special Forces uh, Operational Detachment Delta, which is uh, otherwise known as Delta Force, and they're supporting this operation. So here we get into some of the action with these guys. I'll take this guy out if I can. You can see already how dynamic these guys are in taking cover, changing positions. He went to the crouching position there. So just this is just demonstrating how dynamic they are and, and how they're moving from cover to cover. Uh, shooting at you while they're, while they're doing that, changing positions. Trying to keep you guessing. All right. All right. So let's talk about. First of all, Fear was released in October of 2005, and a lot of what's said in this video is based on Dr. Tommy Thompson's analysis of the uh, Fear AI, and there was a paper written previous to that that was an analysis of it. Uh, this is not going to be an academic video by any means. Uh, it's more of a. Uh, uh, from a player's standpoint. All right. So first of all, let's talk about what it means to be a uh, tactical shooter. By definition, the original Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six was probably the first tactical shooter. Uh, so what what does it mean to be tactical? Um, tactical is just careful planning to achieve typically a military objective. All right, and I know I use that word all the time, and I just changed the, the channel name to a burn tactical. All it is is careful planning to achieve uh, some sort of, of military goal, or you know, it's been used in police goals, or whatever the case may be. Uh, so when we talk about something being a tactical shooter, it requires careful planning. If you look at the original Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six, it uh, required careful planning and actually had a planning stage before you actually executed the mission. So that is uh, the definition of a tactical shooter. Obviously, believable AI. So 
when we talk about artificial intelligence in this, uh, one important thing to remember is that when when programmers create a piece of software, all right, or a game or a simulation, right? The software knows everything. It's it's omniscient, right? It knows where everybody is, knows where you are, it knows where your bullets are going. It knows the structure of this uh, this building. It knows exactly you know where to spawn that crate or that pole. Uh, it knows every bullet in your weapon, uh, the trajectory of it. It knows uh, exactly your position, x and x y z coordinates, as well as uh, every single enemy's position. So when we're talking about artificial intelligence, the software or the game is completely omniscient. It knows everything at every given time. And the goal of developers is to limit the knowledge of artificial intelligence. When we see, uh, sometimes we'll call them aimbots, or uh, you know, aimbots comes from a, a robot, obviously that has uncanny capabilities of aiming, right? So when we look at artificial intelligence, we want it to be human-like, and humans experience all sorts of things. Uh, and we make mistakes and we have fallacies. So when creating artificial intelligence, we, as a gamer, you look for those fallacies and the more present they are, the more believable the AI is. Okay. And usually when those uh, human-like characteristics such as fear, inaccuracy, preservation of their own life aren't present, we think that the AI is dumb, or it's too hard, or robotic, etc. And what fear does, it, it's kind of a, almost a benchmark in artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of people study it, um, want to replicate what it's, what it's done. And so let's take a look at why this is so successful, and why it is a benchmark for artificial intelligence. I'll just go out here. So you can see that guy's down right now. And he just noticed that, so he began searching for the target. You can see he moved from this position of cover right here. The, uh, the AI use a system called A star. an A star search algorithm and essentially what it is is an algorithm which says it's not just for navigation that guy flanked this completely came up behind us alright so I'm having way too much fun with this and I gotta get back to the topic at hand uh, A star search basically says I want to get from point A to point B right so uh, what is the l most efficient way of doing that? And if you kind of think about all artificial intelligence programming is in the most simplistic form, if you want to make it believable, is making the NPCs act like human-like. Okay, that's all it is, right? So logically, right, as human beings, we're very intelligent. Uh, we have a brain that can process amazing things. And if I want to get from this point to that point in real life, I'm probably going to walk in a straight line, right? Uh, I'm not going to go around here, around this crate, or anything like that, unless there is something that is dangerous here. Maybe there's a, I don't know, venomous snake or some other, maybe there's a puddle there, right, that I don't want to step in. So in that case, I would quickly plan uh, a different route. And that's what A-Star Search is. It's just the most efficient way of getting from point A to point B. All right. Uh, obviously, that would be a, just a straight line. Now, there's various ways of getting there. I can go left uh, and avoid that danger, or I might go right and avoid that danger, but ultimately, I want to end up there. This is what Fear uses. A lot of games use A-Star Search. Um, again, this is based on, on uh, Dr. Tommy Thompson's lecture. Uh, and the other thing it uses is Finite State Machines. Uh, finite State Machines says... Uh, 
I'm going to go from point A to point B, and when I get there, I'm going to perform some sort of animation. Maybe that's shooting the gun. Maybe that's uh, finding cover. Uh, maybe that is interacting with the environment. So the finite, finite state machine has three states. Uh, number one is... That was pretty cool. He just ducked behind that. He knew that I was here and decided I'm going to go in there uh, and check it out when I was behind that cover. And he decided that the quickest way to do that would be here. Now, the AI in fear understand that, hey, the player is pointing his gun in my direction. But I think there was a moment of distraction there where he decided, you know what, I'm going to take the risk because I need to, uh, one of the goals is to kill the player, and so that's what he decided to do. Uh, Finding State Machine has three states. One is uh, is uh, moving from A to B, or navigation state. And number two is an animation, okay? The third state is interacting with a special node in the environment. So uh, maybe there's a, uh, the example he gives is a table that I need to flip over. Maybe there's a door that I need to open, right? Maybe I need to play a special animation like he just did to go under that garage door, effectively. Um, and so what happens is, is, th is that the A star uh, search works with the finite state machine or tells the finite state machine um, or it doesn't tell but it, it figures out point, from point A to B what's the most efficient route uh, and in that efficient route what is the danger that I'm presented with okay now what's unique about fear is that the AI have a self-preservation intelligence and their primary goal in the game is not necessarily to kill the uh, player. It is actually to preserve their own life. All right. So number one goal is preserve their own life. Number two goal, kill the player. Right. Uh, so for instance, if I chuck a grenade in that direction, and that player, and he decided that he's going to uh, a star search from point A over here to point B to try to kill me. If he sees a grenade launched in that area, his self-preservation overrides any commands of, tr of any goals that he has, and he will immediately cancel that uh, plan and go behind cover. All right, so one of the very impressive things about AI in fear and, and showing human-like characteristics is that they, they distribute or they display a tremendous amount of fear, self-preservation, panic. Uh, you can hear the panic in, the, in, the, in their voices and things like that. Uh, and it is extremely impressive. So the final thing in fear is uh, the squad, and I am simplifying the entire AI structure and the coding uh, in its, its most basic form here, but the final thing is a squad brain or a squad leader. All right, uh, It's unseen, and what it is is if these AI are in proximity, they, uh, within a certain proximity of each other, they become part of one squad. And the squad brain is going to coordinate their attack. The, the NPCs, even though it appears that they communicate with, one, with each other, they'll say things like flank left, take cover, throw a grenade, um, you know, he's killing us, wh whatever the case may be. They're actually not communicating with one another. They're communicating with the squad brain. All right? And the squad leader is going to give commands to these guys. It knows that I'm here, and if they are aware of my presence, uh, then it will tell one to maybe uh, flank right. It might tell one to throw suppressive fire in my direction. It might tell one to uh, go around the back and flank me from behind, uh, like it told this guy. So they're actually unaware of each other's uh, presence, but the squad brain makes it so that it seems like they're coordinating and they're working together. And in fact, they are working together they just don't know that they're they're doing it so it's kind of uh interesting to see that there's a number of things that, that the AI does they will um shoot from their shoulder or do point shooting instead of aiming down sights if they're moving from one point of cover to another uh and they typically tend to move from cover to cover you'll never really see them just standing out in the open standing here and just shooting at you in most titles that you see uh specifically talking about maybe call of duty and, and a lot of AI, they will typically stand in the open, not take cover, or if they do take cover, they will literally stand in the same spot and kind of do a peek, peekaboo type of thing. That doesn't happen in fear. So, 
thinking about you know arguably uh, I would say that this is somewhat of a tactical shooter the AI certainly is up to par f with a tactical shooter however uh, it is a horror first you know person shooter nonetheless uh, when we look at games like Ghost Recon and Raven Shield we can certainly learn from the realistic portrayal of non-player characters in this type. So let me show you a little bit more of uh, gameplay if I can. I'll keep moving around here. You got a nice light there. I think there's a little hard point here. Yeah, this is some weird paranormal activity that's occurring. And if you haven't played it, I'm not going to give away any uh, plot points. Don't worry about that. Okay, so there's another guy there. And I'm going to try just a, a quick experiment here. And I'm going to shoot in his general direction and just see how he reacts. Immediately decide to play. Interesting. Alright, so f for whatever reason, <laughs> they decided that they were going to they were gonna rush him. Alright, he decided he's going to retreat, and he's peeking behind cover there. I don't know if you can hear him, he's actually calling for some sort of backup. And again, they're not really communicating, they're talking to the squad brain. Right now he's trying to suppress me, and he's uh, staying behind cover here. He is asking for covering fire. Okay, so he just got shot. Let's see what he does. This guy is set in a covering fire position, and he just asked him to flank me. So look, he's coming around here. He's still in a covering fire position. And he's down. So let's see what this guy does. I think he decided to retreat somewhat. You do have some uh, slow-mo ability, which is kind of interesting to see how things play out. I think he's behind mm -hmm. that, uh, that crate there. Alright, so all in all, they are moving from cover to cover. These two guys decided to suicide, suicide rush, and that's fine because they were within close proximity. They outnumbered me, decided to do that. So it's very dynamic. They do react to the player's actions. Uh, if they're taking incoming fire, they will react to that. As you can see, we kind of looked at takedown and uh, the fact that, yeah, they do move around and cover, but not very effectively. In this title, they actually do it very, very well. You can see that once I was sending rounds down range, um, they pretty much stayed, you know, behind behind this cover here, but also tried to maneuver on me. Now there was nowhere really to go because there was there's just no way to f to uh, get behind that room there. There's nowhere to flank, uh, but they were actively trying to figure out a way to uh, to defeat me. And so what happened is, is that this guy just stood right behind here. And just continue taking shots right? while he was the maneuvering element uh, and decided to try to figure out a way to get around me. All right, so that was that's pretty interesting. All right, so when we talk about tactical thinking as far as the artificial intelligence, what are they doing, and is it believable? And the only th the only thing you have to really ask to answer that question is: Is it human like? Is it what I would do in that situation? Right. Um, when we talk about how the player reacts, obviously you as the player, you know you can restart the game, you can, uh, you have health, right? So the way that you react in the game is actually way more uh, reckless than what you would do in real life. You know, chances are you probably wouldn't even come into this room at these guys, right? Um, unless you were especially trained or something like that. The AI, however, the way they're programmed is that they have one life, as far as they know. 
and they're actively trying to preserve that. You can see that right now I have the settings on easy and if you go medium, hard, or difficult it actually increases the accuracy and the weapon damage that the enemies do to you. It doesn't, to my knowledge, uh, change anything about the, the default uh, artificial intelligence behavior. But you can see as he was shooting from cover, right? Most of the rounds, in fact, all the rounds when I was when I was here behind cover, missed me. They hit the wall or whatever. Why is inaccuracy in a tactical shooter or any game believable? I want to talk about some of those reasons. Number one, uh, there, there's a difference between you know if you guys ever been shoot at a shooting range or something like that. You know, there's a difference between being at a range and shooting at a paper target or a fixed target that is not firing back at you, right? You're very relaxed, you're just kind of sitting around the range, focusing on your, your grip, your breathing, uh, your your sight alignment, all that other stuff, right? That is very different. If you, if you hear uh, army guys or um, marine infantry talk about the difference between combat shooting and range shooting, it's huge. Combat shooting deals with the ability to adapt and acclimate to a chaotic uh, environment where, where it's life and death at every moment, right? So just because you're a good competitive shooter, maybe you do three gun or you do like uh, some other competitive shooting, does not mean that if you're put in a combat environment or a real, um, you know, life-threatening environment, that you would be able to react under that stress. All right. So just kind of follow, stay with me and follow this story. If an army veteran comes back from Iraq uh, after combat operations in infantry, special operations, special forces, whatever, and he encounters a uh, deadly force encounter, right, with an active shooter, with a criminal, whatever the case may be, he's going to be much more acclimated to to that adrenaline rush and that adrenaline dump that happens in your body. Your hands start shaking. You get tunnel vision. Uh, you're unable to really focus on your target. Um, you try to remember the fundamentals, the training kicks in, but at the end of the day, that adrenaline dump is not something that you are trained for and it's not something that you are exposed to. Um, there was an officer, of, uh, or there was a story of an officer who went to the range all the time. He uh, got in a first deadly encounter uh, situation of his life and he shot something like 16 rounds at a suspect that was uh, point blank range we're talking 10 feet right or even less and he said that he was absolutely shocked because every single round missed he ended up chasing the guy into the field they exchanged some more shots and he ended up grazing the guy in his calf and that was the only hit that he got now this was a guy who was the most proficient in his department he was uh, highly skilled went to the range every single week very proficient with his firearm and yet in a deadly encounter situation he was unable to uh, get rounds on target all right so the point is is that in video games all right we have to account for that developers have to account for that if you're a tier one operator and you're playing like uh, I remember no Velocity Delta Force right your recoil management should be a lot better your accuracy should be a lot better than a terrorist who, yeah, he's going to go through a training camp or something like that, but he's not going to have anywhere near the range time, the knowledge, and the accuracy that a special operations guy has. Does that make sense? Uh, so in other words, when in Ghost Recon, you're going up against, you know, militia or drug cartels or something like that, they should not have the same accuracy as a tier one operator does. Uh, at the same time, the special operations guy, he's also going through an adrenaline dump. His hands are shaking. He's much more acclimated to it. But you're not going to be anywhere near as accurate uh, in a combat environment or a combat shooting environment as you are on, on the range. So game developers, when you guys are looking at stats for guns and you're like, hey, you know, this could have a uh, certain accuracy, a one-inch accuracy, a one MOA accuracy at this range, and it has this much dispersion, you know, after 400 meters and it loses this velocity, that's all great on paper, but you need to account for the fear, the adrenaline, the uh, self-preservation, not only for the player, but also for, for the artificial intelligence. And I think that's something that Fear does extremely well. Uh, I've played tactical shooters for, I don't know, 15 years now. 
uh, everything from from the original Ghost Recon, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six, all the way up to uh, the the uh, Armor series, and you don't see too much self-preservation uh, in that, and that's kind of kind of sad. So I'd like to see more of that in uh, tactical shooters. Uh, also for the player, what are the consequences for the player? How can you make that? And they just heard me walking here. How can you make that more immersive for the player? Self-preservation. Well, obviously realistic damage. If you get shot in the head, you're done. If you get shot in the chest, maybe you're wearing body armor. You might be able to take a couple. It might affect your breathing. might affect your accuracy. If you get shot in the leg, you can't move as fast. The realistic damage model does a lot for the player feeling that tension of wanting to preserve his life. Right Now, if you have regenerating health, like in Call of Duty, obviously you don't really care that much, right? Because I know that all I got to do is if I get shot, get behind a wall here, hang out for a few seconds, wait till the screen. Whoa. I think he's walking up there. Wait till the screen, uh, you know, stops turning red, and then I'm back in the action. somebody else out there and I do want to interject some gameplay along with this discussion they will see your flashlight if you uh, shine it some enemies that are going to spawn in that direction, so this will be a good kind of encounter. You can see it kick that door open. They just call target sighted. There's a back way here, so they might try to come around that way. I really like the smoke effects too. It adds a lot of tension because you, you can't see when you're being suppressed. And that's one thing I want to talk about is sounds in games as well as visual effects. One of the best examples of this is um, insurgency. When you're being suppressed, when rounds are, are hitting around you, there's smoke kicking up, there's dust kicking up, debris from the impact of rounds. You can hear the rounds that are loud, uh, and then there's a little bit of uh, visual effects as well. Uh, Squad does this with the uh, screen kind of blurring and things like that. And that's extremely important for a player to know that, hey, I'm in danger, right? It can't just be, oh, I just got shot, right? There's got to be a uh, visual sensation, audio, um, as much as you can produce in a, in a video game on a screen that will immerse the player in, in knowing that he is absolutely in danger. So that combined with the realistic damage. Cool. <laughs> that was pretty cool, just threw a grenade. You can see he's right there behind cover. And he just spotted me. You can see how inaccurate that weapon is right now. And why he's moving and he's shooting from, from the hip, right? There he is, behind cover. I'm doing the same thing. The way you know you have great AI is if whatever you're doing, if the if the artificial intelligence is mirroring that, and it, you know it's good, right? Because they're acting in a human-like fashion. I'm gonna suppress him. He's behind the color. He's asking for help. I just threw another grenade here. And now they're retreating just slightly there. See the dust here. Alright, he just got killed. But the entire time that we're, we're exchanging uh, rounds, I'm behind cover. 
peeking behind cover, he's peeking behind cover, right? That feels absolutely realistic. This guy's gonna try it again. Again, they still have an objective to destroy the player, but they're also trying to preserve their own life. Now, you can make this AI even more careful, right? Maybe some of them will retreat and never come back. Uh, maybe some of them will go behind cover and never take their head out because they're just, they're frozen, right? Uh, it's it's uh, fight, flight, or a lot of people forget the third one, it's freeze, right? You can just freeze, totally lock up, don't know what to do. Kind of like a deer in the headlights. That happens to hum humans as well. Uh, so that was that was a pretty good demonstration. All right, so I'm on, I'm on the other end here. Let's go ahead and reload real quick. All right, where do we go here? And I hope this video is not too long. Like I said, I want to interject gameplay along with the analysis. Uh, I'm not a game <laughs> developer. I had you know, I tried a little, I tried to recreate Ghost Recon in Unreal and realized it was way over my head, way too much work for one guy. Uh, it's a lot of work for 30 people, in fact. But uh, this is coming from a, a gamer's perspective. All right, let's see what they do here. I'm gonna throw a grenade down there and just. All right, and they avoided that successfully. So. And I'm out of cover. Let's see what happens when I'm not in cover. And they just kind of disappeared. Now they are pathfinding that A star search. They're constantly trying to figure out a way to get to you on the catwalk. Okay. The, the squad brain is giving them commands. Oh, nice job. And the squad brain is actively trying to get to you, but if they sense that they're in a situation where um, they're in too much danger, they will actually just uh, not obey the command. So this is some very impressive artificial intelligence. All right, let's see what they do here. You can see uh, just comparing this to even um, Even comparing this to like, the, uh, they're all shooting and moving at the same time. Shooting, moving, and communicating. Right? Even comparing this to takedown, you can see how much more dynamic uh, and active these guys are. All right, so they still got a job to do. They still got to take me out, but they're trying to do that as efficiently as possible without without killing themselves, right? They know this guy just got shot, so um, they m probably will not cross here. A lot of times on Ghost Recon Classic, <laughs> where a guy will get killed in this you know, fatal funnel, this doorway right here, and then you'll just get a pile of bodies, you know, because they don't realize that, hey, this is a danger zone, right? doesn't happen as much here. Uh, I mean, they only have so many options to get to me because this is the only entrance. But uh, it's in Call of Duty, I mean, you'll get stacks of bodies, like 50 high, in the same exact spot. Same thing with uh, Rainbow Six Siege. I keep hearing them behind me, but they're actually not. Let's see what he does here. And he's going somewhere down there. Oh, he went right, I think. I'm not sure where he went. 
Okay, you didn't see it on the video, but that guy literally went all the way around um, this guy that I just killed here. He literally went, did a star search, found this path around me because that was a hard point. That was a stronghold that I had. And went all the way around into here. And came all the way around here. That was that was pretty crazy. Um, the guy who designed the AI for this gave a lot of credit to the uh, to the level designers. And you know you got to give credit where credit is due. It's true that the openness of the, of this level and the fact that there's so many different ways to get from point A to point B, uh, they do they do quarter quarter you at certain points because they do want the game to progress. They want you to go. You have to go to certain locations and everything. Um, but the fact that the AI had so many choices, they may have three or four different paths to get to a location. That really. Uh, that really helped the uh, artificial intelligence design. And you can see here there's, there's horror mixed with the uh, tactical action. Anyway, this will probably be the end of this video. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this analysis of artificial intelligence in fear and how it applies to future tactical shooters and titles and what's currently out there. So I really hope we see some of these concepts uh, displayed in fear in other titles. Alright, this has been a burner video. Thank you guys for watching. And I'll see you guys next time.